Good morning, champions. Yeah, it's good to see you today. So sit today like you are one with the hair of all things because all things are yours, all things beautiful, all things worthy, all things that answer to Christ, they answer to you. So would you want to stand up and sit again if you are not sitting very well, like you are one with the heir of all things, like all things are mine, hallelujah. Turn and tell somebody, you are one with the heir of all things. You can share whatever you have. Would you mind telling that to another person? You are one with the heir of all things. You can share whatever you have. Hallelujah. Yes, we are still in the assembly of the God begotten. And we are still looking at what it means to be begotten of love. Today I bring a new scripture. John chapter 15 verse 12. This is my commandment, Jesus said. That you love one another as I have loved you. And we know from our series so far that this love does not puff up. This love is not selfish. This love is not envious. This love is not jealous. Today, our focus is on the first Corinthian scripture of th chapter 13, verse 5. Love seeketh not her own. When it has to do with this series, somehow I tend to lean more on King James because it brings out something. The Good News translation will say love is not selfish. The Amplified of where we read said, this is my commandment that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another as I have loved you. If you look around society today, you will see that selfishness is at the root, is the root of all the ills in our families churches, societies, organizations, and nations. The world exhorts us daily to do things that make us happy. There are actually selfish statements that are widely acceptable, whether locally or globally. I need them are fighting for. How many of us have been hearing it? Don't give it your all. Don't sacrifice too much. These are statements that are very selfish. They, they, they feed our selfishness and staff our selflessness. These are words that are not in Christ. And wherever you find selfishness, you're going to find envy, boasting, pride, unseemly, un, unseemliness. You're going to find arrogance wherever selfishness is found. Selfishness make deep. Make vain our deep learning. Say, oh, I'm a, I'm a professor. Paul said, shut up. You are a noisy gong. Oh, I'm a doctor. Paul said, keep quiet. If you don't have love and you've traveled the world, you are a clanging symbol. You're making noise. Selfishness. Today's theme literally covers every single thing that that scripture has to talk about. And as I studied, four words jumped out at me and I just want to Explain the scripture using those four words. First, self-serving. Second, ego. Three, third, convenience. And fourth, manipulation. So let these words help us understand what Paul meant by, he said, by saying, love does not seek its own. Self-serving. This is working or acting for your own advantage. You see, selfishness and servanthood, they do not live on the same street. They don't go together. Love is servanthood. The world teaches us to approach every situation with the question, what is in this for me? Christ says that should not be your approach. Rather, you should say, how does this benefit or build up my brother? How does this glorify God? Love is never me first. It doesn't, it, it love, the love of God in us is God first. Others second, you third. You don't even come second. But that's even where the irony comes. And then we turn to God and say, oh Lord, I love you. I said, he said, wait, wait. If you want to tell me you love me, to show me that you love me, love your brother. So essentially, he points you back to your brother, putting people first. So if our favorite mantra 
if, you, if as you're sitting down here, your favorite mantra in every situation, including marriage, school, anything is what is in this for me. If you behave in your own, if you behave only in your own self-interest, regardless of how selfless others around you behave, if in your arsenal, the only skills you have are those that advance your personal agendas or self-serving motives at the expense of others. If you take credit for everything positive and you blame others for anything negative, all things negative, if you change to act excessively or solely in a manner that benefits yourself, even if every other person is disadvantaged, Paul says you are selfish. And he offers a solution. In Philippians, in chapter 2, I think from verse 5, 3 to 5 and then 21, it says, Be free, free yourself from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm you. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart, but in authentic humility put others first, and view people as more important than yourself. He said, Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a concern for, for what, possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. When you look at the word abandon and you look at the word possess, it speaks to intentionality and decision. You are the one to abandon it. It's not prayer. You are the one to walk away from certain behaviors. Let's look at the, certain, the second word. Ego. The author of the book Ego, Ego is the enemy, Ryan Holiday couldn't have captured ego better than in that statement. Ego is really the enemy of love and life. You cannot wear ego on your sleeve and then you will roll it up to serve other people. Ego nourishes self-promotion and puts pressure on, on you to seek your own glory. Jesus himself said, I have no need, I never have a need to seek my own glory. Why? Because he is love and love does not seek its own. Love is not selfish. A selfish man is one who is alive to his ego and dead to Christ. We are called, we are begotten of love to manifest love. We are commanded to live and love like Christ. So, and if we are to do that, we have to go back to Christ. And Christ himself said, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if we are to love people appropriately as Jesus loves us, we, are, we have to nail our egos to the cross of Christ and live holy for Jesus. Let's keep going. Convenient. Where do we even begin from to calculate the, the costs of convenience to life and destinies? Is it in our public hospitals where medical personnel should not quickly respond to emergencies because it came at an odd hour? Or is it because... You, an emergency came in and they were on call, they were answering call, they were, they were having a conversation with a friend. I think when I say conversation, it sounds very Polish. When the woman was in labor, you know, and the name could not end for them to attend to the woman because it wasn't convenient. Have we not heard of those skin coiling stories of nurses and doctors putting patients laboring women, accident victims on hold until they are done with their personal engagement. Sometimes some of these people do not live to tell the story. How many lives have convenience taken in our medical spaces? How many destinies have convenience thwarted in our civil services? How many families have convenience ruined in our public services? people's gratuities or other entitlements that are left unpaid because the officers in charge could not go through the inconvenience of going through the files to do what needed to be done and process the file on time for what needed to be done to be done on time. And most times those people die. Can we even begin to talk about how much convenience has robbed us in families, in schools, in our societies, in organizations? How do we even begin to calculate the amount of money swallowed up by, by convenience in paying the school fees of children who wouldn't inconvenience themselves to study hard, go the extra miles and pass the examination? Convenience cannot go hand in hand with love. 
How much can, can we even sit down to do that? As I start to prepare this, all that came to me were questions. Because how many lives have been robbed by convenience? How many destinies? How many ideas? How many businesses? How many marriages? Because we couldn't just afford to put the other person first when it wasn't convenient. We want to relate with you at our own level, on our own pace, at our own pace, on our own level. Love does not move when it's convenient. I will leave us and the Holy Spirit, because when I got here, I just had to pray that the Holy Spirit will begin to explain to us the many ways that convenience is robbing us and eating at our love life. Love does not move when it's convenient. Love doesn't always seek what is best for self at the expense of others. Love sincerely attempts to do anything it can so that others may be saved. But all of what I have said, they lay a very beautiful foundation for the last word. Convenience, ego, a self-serving attitude, they form a perfect foundation for the ultimate cold guy manipulation to rule. How do I explain this word that can keep us here for hours? So I'll go through a mirror and trust the Holy Spirit to let you know if you're already operating in a manipulative um, way, or if this is already working in your life, if all your actions arise from concern with your own welfare or advantage in regard to or in disregard to others, that you don't do anything unless it has you are at the center. If if you only act out of your own convenience, if you are an expert at scheming, if you have no regard for how your behavior affects others. If you exploit the weakness of others for your own pleasure, if you consistently act in your own self-interest instead of meeting the needs of others, if you can't take no for an answer, instead you go to great lengths to maneuver the situation to go in your benefit, if you have no genuine empathy for the suffering of other people, if telling the truth feels alien to you, or if you hide the truth, especially if you want something from somebody or a particular response from somebody, so you hide the, tr the truth, you, you avoid it, you stretch it, you ignore it so that the person will act in a particular way. If you show no remorse when you have behaved in a manner that hurts other people, if you manipulate others to get what you want, if you guilt strip people for your own advantage, if you are always asking for favors but never repairing them, you know, sometimes you, you know, say, give me five naira, I'll give you back in two days. You know in your heart of hearts that there is no five naira coming back. But you ask. If you are always making promises and never keeping them, if you do nice things for people with expectations that they will come back and benefit you. So while the people are busy saying thank you, God bless you, you are calculating your return on investment. If, you, if unkindness is where you live and your kindness comes with a price, if using others to get what you want comes very naturally to you, if you spew lies and make malicious statements about other people as a way of punishing them because you couldn't have your way with them or things didn't go as you planned, you know, if you negatively respond to things not going your way so as a matter of fact you now find a way of punishing those people because i'd wanted to use your pocket i called you my atm and you did not respond so i have to find a way of tarnishing your image because why i came into your life was because i looked at you and you looked like you could pay my bills and now that is not working what do i do why are you no longer friends with so 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 person man the man is to this is to that and you know it's not true if you're always taking and never giving back, if you feel entitled to always getting what you want, irrespective of what that means to other people, if you are excessively or exclusively concerned with yourself, only seeking or concentrating on your own advantage, your own pleasure, your own well-being, it has to benefit you one way or the other, otherwise you're not involved. If you, if you knowingly behave in ways that hurt other people for your own advantage. Paul says you are manipulative and your love is selfish. Love has an unselfish concern and, and for others and a willingness to do what is best for another person. 
I said all of this because I just wanted to come up here today and define a selfish person as one who is egotistic, self-serving, insensitive, and ultimately manipulative. If I just define that, it would not make sense. But as we go back home, let's sit with the Holy Spirit and tell him, extray my heart. Am I egotistic? Am I self-serving? Am I greedy? Am I insensitive? Are they aspects of my life that are manipulating others? Because it's the Holy Spirit that can simply help you to see these things. Otherwise, you walk around and just feel, this is not me. A selfish person is incapable of doing things for the benefit of others. He's incapable of loving others and he's incapable of loving himself. He does not have the capacity to love any which way. The love of God in us does not insist on its own right. Does not demand to have its own way. Does not seek its advantage. But what does it do? It adapts itself to the interest of others. It is not selfish. It does not seek its own at, at the expense of others. The world has no cure for selfishness. God does. He puts that cure in a person. He's called Jesus Christ. So right now, wherever you are seated, or as we stand to make our confession, if the Holy Spirit has, has, has spoken to your heart, that like, here, stop, this, is, this one is wrong. This one has convicted you in one way or the other. All you have to do is to exchange that heart for his own. And just ask him, Lord, take this heart from me and give me yours. Please rise and let us affirm the word of God together. For we are called to love as Christ does. But this is not something you and I can do by our strength. Say this with me. I am called to love like Jesus. Jesus came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. I intentionally serve and meet the needs of those around me. The love of God in me is not self-seeking. Say it like you mean it. I will not always demand to have my own way. Neither will I selfishly seek my own honor. I am one with the heir of all things. I am winning the war within myself. Poverty has no hold on my mind. Greed and insensitivity find no expression in me. I can share the resources currently at my disposal. I am not selfish. I do not only seek my own advantage. I commit today to unselfishly seek the best for the people around me. My life will reflect the love I receive daily from God. I am Christ's ambassador of love. I represent God among the people I live with. The love of God in me is not self-serving. My love won't always be me first. I am dead to myself and alive to Christ. My life of love points men to Christ. I commit to rebuilding the relationships ruined by past selfishness. I won't always seek what is best for me at the expense of others. My strengths and resources are for service, not for status. I am commanded to love like Jesus. Jesus did not live to please himself. I do not live for my own pleasure. My goal is to empower others to do what is right for them. Today, I break out of the culture of selfishness. I abandon every display of self-centeredness and pride. God's love in me expresses itself through selflessness. 
I am generous and gracious to all as Christ is so am I in this world amen I want you to just raise your voice and say Holy Spirit help me to love the way you do help me to walk in love help me to walk in love help me to walk in love I work in love in me I work in love in me there's something God is doing in this assembly there's something he's preparing us for there's an outpouring he's preparing us for so tell him Lord that which you are birthed 